One thing I think people often don't realize is that their weaknesses, some of our worst attributes, actually can be great strengths. So, for example, one thing is that people often, they're trying something new, they're learning something new, they're in a new job, and they feel like a fake, an imposter. They'll think, oh, other people are so much better than me. How am I going to be able to do this? And that feeling of, of being a, a kind of a fake can be a powerful strength because what that does is it helps you to avoid being overconfident. And actually being overconfident is one of the biggest problems for people. They come in, they think they know everything, but then they're not open to learning flexibly the way they need to. So if you're a little unsure of yourself, just remember, that can be a great strength. So you might ask, what does expertise look like when you're looking in the brain? Well, we don't really have good enough imagery yet that we can go specifically and look at a set of linked neurons, but that's really what expertise is. It, when you learn something and you learn it really well, you are linking together a set of neurons that you can easily access from your working memory, that, that temporary storage place. You can reach into long-term memory where you have this nice set of linked neurons, and that's your expertise. And experts in any subject, whether it's math or science or learning a language or being a, a master roller skater, whatever you're learning, maybe a musical instrument, you have created lots and lots of sets of neural links. And what you can do in your working memory, that sort of temporary, I like to think of it like a, a, as a, an attentional octopus. And it's got four arms. And it can reach one of those arms down, in fact, a couple of them, and connect into those sets of neural links that you have in long-term memory. And it can pull it up into mind and that's how you might be able to play a really nice chord on, on the guitar. Or how you can easily back up a car when it was really hard to start with. All of these kinds of things, including doing mathematical equations, are its information stored in sets of links that you pull into mind when you want to do something. And that's how you become an expert. So what I would recommend to the teachers of Spain, to the parents of Spain who are trying to help their children to learn more effectively, I think one of the best things you can do is learn more about how the brain learns. So just as I spoke about sets of neural links, and that's how you create them as you're becoming an expert in something. Well, people often don't know that when you're first learning something, it takes a little time to create those sets of neural links. So for some people, sure, they're super fast learners. They can sit right down and they can learn something really quickly. But other people are much slower in how they create those sets of neural links. But they can create very deep, very useful sets of neural links because of the fact that they, it takes them longer to learn something. Sometimes I like to think of it like this. You, there are people who have race car brains. They can get to the finish line really fast. And other people have something more like hiker brains. They can get to the finish line, but it's a lot slower. They have to walk in order to get there. But while they're walking, they can reach out, they can touch the leaves on the trees, they can, they can hear the birds singing, they can see the little rabbit trails. So for them, their learning is much deeper and richer. So if you are a slow learner, rejoice. There are sometimes times where you can see things, you can put ideas together that even geniuses can, can struggle with. So I think that's an important thing for both parents and teachers to remember about students who may not be race car brain types, but they can still really do well in the long run. 
So you might ask, how is memory structured in people? And there are, the reality is there are two fundamentally different aspects of memory. And one is your, your short-term memory, which is pretty close to what I'll call working memory or what psychologists call working memory. And that is as opposed to long-term memory. And long-term memory, of course, is, you know, you'll remember the name of your teacher or your own name or your address, facts you know very well. So working memory is something that you're holding temporarily in mind. Now, sometimes people will have working memories that are really, really strong. So they're, they're uh, normal individuals can hold about three things, like three numbers, three ideas, or four in mind. Some people can hold six, seven, eight, nine, and they're really retentive, really strong working memories. So for me, for example, uh, my working memory is not so good. And so I, I struggle to hold things in mind sometimes. So someone will give me a list of things and I'll be I'm like, okay, I've got it, I've got it, it's holding in mind. And then, woo, shiny, something distracts me and something will fall out. But research has shown that people who have a poor working memory like me, they often are quite creative because when if you can hold four things in mind and something falls out well something else comes in and that's where the creativity comes from mm -hmm.